us. Thank you for being here. And uh, what a privilege it is. Beautiful day today. And I'm um, thankful for the cooler, dry weather that we had today. And that was a blessing for sure. And uh, I'm thankful for uh, some, some people that came up and did some work this week and uh, blew off the driveway. It was too wet to do earlier this week. But somebody came and did it today and what a privilege that was. And We've had some young men working on the annex building and if you go down there, you, if you want to go down there and peek in the rooms, go ahead, but please just peek. Don't go wandering off in the rooms, please. Uh, we're widening rooms, we're enlarging rooms and moving some things. Uh, so there's a lot going on down there. I'm thankful for that. And uh, I'm uh, thankful for those men that have come and are willing to give their time and effort to do that. Talk to somebody today that wants to buy our trailers. And they want them now. And I said, hallelujah. And then he said, you know, I said, well, you know, I, I got one trailer that I said, it's about, oh, man, we probably got about half of it empty. He goes, don't worry, I'll get a football team over here and we'll unload it if you're ready to get it sold. Come on now. I tell you what, God is so good to us. And he was serious about that. He said, I'll, I'll have, I got a, I, my boy plays football, and they, they bench press a ton. He said, and I'll, I'll get him to make a few phone calls, and we'll have guys over there. We'll have uh, an entire team over there ready to unload that truck. And all of us that had to, would have to do it said, amen, you know. <laughs> you know, so uh, God just keeps, keeps rolling, keeps things coming in. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful. Brother Garraway just stopping in. What a privilege it is to have him in. Listen, if you ever, if he's in town and you want to go soul winning, you want to, you want to learn how to go soul winning, he's the man to go with. Right. He will teach you and show you, and uh, he is just a soul winning fanatic, and I love it. I absolutely love it. Uh, B-I-M-I, is that correct, brother? No, it's not. What is it? Reseeding America Ministries. That's it. Reseeding America Ministries. And uh, for some reason, I got the wrong one in my mind, but I, I'll get it to get to it in a minute. But uh, traveling all over the place, and uh, he was sharing with me tonight that uh, prayerfully this upcoming year, his wife's going to try to travel with him more. And man, what a blessing and miracle that is! And, and I'm thankful for God working in his heart and life. I'm thankful for how he's using you. And uh, what a privilege it is to listen when he comes into town. If he's in town for any time, any length of time at all, he's always here and he's always going soul winning for us. And I am so thankful for people that that's their heart's desire. And uh, listen, that needs to be our goal and our heart's desire every Saturday and every day that you have a track in your pocket, track in your in your in your purse, and you're handing out the gospel. Look. It'd be great if it has our church information on it, but look, I'll even, I'll even take it if you hand a blank one out because it's all about getting the gospel out. That's what we're called to do. We're called to share the gospel, and God will take care of the rest. I mean, look, James was here on Sunday. He just stopped, he walking his dog. He, uh, you're, I'm, he's not here. I'm just pointing to where he sat. But he was here on Sunday. He was walking his dog and said, what time do your services start? And he got the gospel. He came, got the gospel. And I, I'm telling you, God will keep sending. I'm, ad, I'm, I'm rambling because I've got short notes, and y'all are ready to be done and go home, aren't you? Anybody? <laughs> I love it. Amen. Amen, preacher. Shut up and preach. All right. Anybody not get a copy of the notes for tonight? Anyone across the auditorium I see? Mrs. Renfro has her hand up. Uh, <laughs> Brother Garraway has his hand up. Brian's try, Brother Brian's trying to raise Miss Jennifer's hand so he didn't have to raise his. <clears throat> Brother Brian, just stay there. Brother Steve's already halfway back. Brother Steve, Brother Brian needs one. Michael needs one. There's two ladies on the back row that are backslidden that need one. One of them's my daughter, and she nailed it. I agree. How many more you got? You got enough? Good. Praise the Lord. Listen, I want to thank you for your faithfulness. Galatians chapter 4 tonight. We're going to look at just four short verses tonight. And we're going to cover these and we'll walk through these and make some application tonight. But four short verses and Miss Cindy, Lee, Cindy over here is going, Hallelujah! She's so excited it's only a page and a half and not four. Um, 
Oh, my bad. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to change it to Latin tonight, and I'm going to preach in Greek. What do you think about that? <laughs> hey, I should go sit down. I'm thankful. Listen, I'm thankful for your faithfulness. And I pray that we all glean something from tonight, and we go out applying it. See, it's, it's not, listen, you'll, you'll get this. That's what the message is about. You're not just here to take up space to take in air, you're here to get something from God's Word and take it and use it this week. Galatians chapter 4, let's read the four verses, beginning in verse 8. The Bible says, Paul writing to the church of Galatia, God writing through Paul to the church of Galatia says, And because ye are sons, nope, that's the wrong, let's go to verse 8. How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now... After that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Tonight... The sermon is my labor in vain. Father, tonight we need you. And I pray that you would guide us according to your word. And I pray that we would look to you to change our hearts and lives. That we may grow closer to you. We may live more for you this week. I pray that you'd touch those that could not be here tonight. Encourage them. And I pray that you'd build them up in a special way. Help us to be the ones to go out and encourage and build each other up and win the loss for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Here in Galatians, uh, as I said, God writing through Paul. But Paul penning these words. And, and here, and we'll, we'll walk through these verses just step by step. And then draw some application. Here he says, how be it then when you knew not God. Now this is when they, he's, he's taking them back. Literally he's taking them back. This is when they did not know of God. And literally before salvation. He, he says, now, I want you to think back. Remember, he's got this, this, this battle going on between the, the Judaizers who are trying to come back and add the law back to salvation by grace. And, and, and he, he said, now look. It's almost like he, he takes a break for a minute. He says, now look, guys. Back before salvation, he says, ye did service. Literally, he's talking about you were in bondage. Ye were in bondage. This speaks of a fixed, permanent position. You were in bondage and no hope. Without hope, we are of all men, what? Most miserable. He says, look, ye were in bondage. He's speaking of a thing, a fixed position, nothing they could do about it. He said, unto them which by nature are no gods. You did service Unto them which by nature are no gods. They, they, the idols, they idols, that's nice. The idols that they worshipped and were enslaved by are inanimate objects of man's hand. Literally, these are creations of their own. Man-made idols that, that they were worshipping around the, the city there of Galatia. But I also want you to understand the works of the law which they're trying to bring back in. See, they're going back literally by requiring all these laws that God said, I am here not to condemn the law, but to complete them, to finish them. Here he says, look, you're going back and you're, you're turning this into literally like idol worship. You're taking us back to, because every idol, I was um, talking to one of the missionaries and he was talking about being on the field and, and going into these homes and, and we even saw it in a video where they have so many idols in their, in their home and they've got a list of to-dos that they have to do daily to make sure that they're in good standing with that God. And Paul's trying to protect these, uh, these men and women, these young Christians, from falling back into that entrapment, into that snare. So he's trying to guard them. Verse 9, but now, 
But now, here's a huge transition. Huge transition. Kind of like Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us. Here He says, but now. He says, ye were entangled, enslaved. But now. Man, what an amazing transition. He says, but it's different now. It's not the same now. He says, but now. After that ye have known God. Now he's speaking of the time after their salvation. After they've accepted Christ, he says, now in verse 8, he took them back and he said, now remember. He says, look back. He says, before you were saved, you were enslaved, you were worshiping false idols, you were worshiping false gods, you were worshiping these things. He says, but now, he says, after that ye have known God, after they've accepted Christ as their personal Savior, or rather are known of God. John 10, verse 27. Notice what Paul brings up. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Here he brings up, he says, or rather are known of God. You've taken on a new name. You've taken on now His name. We talked about that uh, last Sunday, talking about His name. I've got His name now. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements? He, he, a pointed question. He says, look, before. Okay, yeah, you did that before. That was before salvation. Now we're talking about after salvation. The words, ye turn. Okay, I wanted to break this down a little bit. Ye turn. This means that it was a present problem. They're actually doing this. It's something that's current with them. He says, ye turn. <coughs> it's a present problem. The word turn means to turn from something as well as to turn to something else. Literally, he says, how can you turn away? This is what he's trying to ask them. How can you turn away from the, new, the, from the grace that I've taught you? For you are saved by grace. How can you turn from that back to this weak and beggarly, as th that which will not help or profit? How can you do that? Again. Notice the word again. That's where he's talking about he means that they were turning back to something they had previously left. If I'm going to do something again, it means I've done it before, right? So he's not just saying turning from grace to something new. He says turning to, from grace back to what they were before. So it's again. Beggarly means something that has no value or that will not help. He says, look, how can you go from salvation by grace through faith that none of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast? How can you turn from that amazing gift back to what you know doesn't profit you? Back to what you know cannot help you? Back to what you know is empty, meaningless. Whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? And he asking a pretty pertinent question. He says, do you really want to be back in bondage again? Do you want to put... And look, this would be by choice at this point. See, we understand for, uh, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. We understand when we're born, we're born into sin. And we have a sin nature. And he says, you are clear, you're freed from that. You're made free. Do you really want to put yourself back into that bondage again? He says, look, ye observe days. Ye observe. Uh, to observe means to keep scrupulously. To neglect nothing requisite to the religious observation. Literally, uh, to make it a little easier for Miss Cindy over here. Religious, yeah, big words, weren't they? They literally began worshiping days and months years 
The little we're turning to uh, here, you'll see days and months and times and years. This is a reference to like a ritualistic or religious observance of the days, months, and years as a religious act. Many turn to the study of time and space and they're looking for the signs of Jesus to return. They began to, to focus on worshiping days and months and times. They were turning themselves back. Because remember, what did they worship before? False gods of the sun. False gods of the moon. False gods of the stars. False gods of the night. False gods of the day. Literally, they had found themselves turning back to that. Now remember the Judaizers. They were simply trying to add law back to grace. But by doing so, what were they doing? They were taking them back further than just grace and law. They were taking them all the way back to before salvation. Not, they weren't losing their salvation, but he was taking them back to where they were submitting themselves back to the gods they were serving before. They had turned them completely. Listen, we've, you've got to be careful. What does the Bible say? That if you yield yourself to obey, members to obey, and I can't quote it right off the top of my head because it's not in my notes, but who we yield ourselves to, we do what? We obey them. And see, they brought in, the Judaizers were bringing back law, adding it to the grace. Oh, you can't just be saved by grace. You've got you to live by the Ten Commandments. Well, what did that do to their hearts and minds? Well, that took them right back to living by commandments of these false gods. What is that old adage, sin? Take you farther than you want to go. Cost you more than you want to pay. Keep you longer than you want to stay. That's right. See what was, what's happening? That allowing that sin back in their lives. And that control, that... that those, those things back in their lives was taking them way back. Verse 11, I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid of you. He's not afraid of them. Okay? He was afraid because he saw them totally rejecting and turning from the truth back to false teaching. If you will, I'm afraid of what you're doing. This is a fear that Paul has. He says, I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid that you are rejecting. You're turning from the true gospel back to false gods. Lest I have bestowed upon you. Listen, he goes, look. He's reminding them of everything. He, all the, um, let's see, all that I have taught you. All the work that I had done for you in ministering to you. Lest I had bestowed upon you. That's what he's talking about when he says bestowed upon you. All the, the preaching, all the teaching, all the study, everything that he's done for them, all the ministering to them and teaching them about the grace of God. He says, I'm afraid of, of you in the fact that you're turning, the decisions you're making, what you're doing, you're turning from, back to this. Because all that work, he, here's what he's going to get to, all that I've done, he says, was a labor in vain. Because of what you're doing, because of this rejection, this turning away of what you know to be true, you're turning my labor to vain. Was it all a waste? Is what he's asking. Was it all a waste? Is it all a waste? Did you heed anything that I had given you? Or was it a waste of time, energy, and effort? I mean, this is what he's thinking. And he's not trying to uh, be rude about it or mean about it, but he says, look, I'm afraid of you because it looks like the things that I was doing because of your rejection, it, it, you've turned it all to vain or emptiness, worthless. Remember, Paul's invested in this church. 
Paul had invested in the people over and over again. And he's talking, remember, he's talking to the church. So it's not just an individual's problem that he's dealing with. He's dealing with a church problem that he sees. And he says, look, I'm, I'm afraid that my labor has been in vain. Because you're rejecting the truth and you're choosing the error. You're choosing the false. Well, I wanted to stop there because as far as our going through this, the verse by verse, because here's the application that I want us to think about tonight. What a question to be asked. I mean, literally Paul's going, was it a waste of time? Was my labor in vain? Literally, if he, he's saying, if you turn from the truth back to the false, my labor was vain. So where do we draw our application before? Let, let's look at this. Let's just break it down. Before. Before God, you were in sin and controlled by sin. Is everybody, does everybody agree with that? Before God, before you knew God, you were in sin and controlled by sin. Correct? Make sense? Okay. Galatians 4, be it, 4, 8. How be it when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. You were in sin. You were controlled. You did service. You served the things of this world. That was before God. After God. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. After salvation... There's a, a, a new law in my members. That law of grace. That law of, uh, of, of the condemnation is now gone. It's no longer there. The fact that sin... Look, sin throughout the Bible, if you look up these references, is let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Let not. In other words, choose. You got a choice. These people had a choice. They could stay with the truth or choose to go back. You have a choice. You can choose to live in grace. And, and, and look, I'm not talking about losing your salvation. I don't want you to get that from this. But I want you to understand, you can choose to live in the power that God has given us through the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. That we can choose not to sin. Or you can choose to let sin reign in your mortal body. You understand that, right? This is yes and this is no. You understand that, right? You, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we have a choice. Before, we didn't have a choice. Because our works were nothing but what? Filthy rags. Your works could do you nothing. But now that we have Christ... We're under His grace and His righteousness. And His Holy Spirit dwells within us. And it guides us to all truth. And at that point, listen, this is what they were doing. This is what the people of Galatia were doing. Now here comes, the, here comes a huge application here. The people of Galatia were recognizing the grace. But choosing the old ways. Whew. Now think about that for a few minutes. They recognized grace. They accepted grace. They accepted Christ. But they were choosing to place themselves under a beggarly, a weak system, a weakened area. And letting that rule over them. So, before you were in sin and sin controlled you. Now, uh, excuse me, after, for sin shall not have dominion over you. You have a, let not sin therefore rule in your mortal body. You have a choice. You can choose 
to stand against Satan and sin. Better yet, yourself and sin. Now, have you gone back? Are you going back? Are you allowing sin to rule over you in your heart and mind? That's what Paul's saying that they're doing. He says, you know what's right, but you're choosing this over here. Christian, now, do you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, but yet you're choosing to place yourself under the weak and beggarly system of the world? Is that what you're choosing to do? That's what he's asking. Is our labor in vain? All that God has sent to minister to you, I want you to think back, okay? Think back to every Sunday school teacher, every pastor, every leader in your church, every family member that has tried to work with you and, and challenge you and try to grow you in His Word. Has it been in vain? Is it in vain? See, it's vain when somebody invests in you. Well, let's put it this way. Someone comes to your house and we, we had this, we had this uh, family a long, long time ago that my wife and I were ministering to and we were striving to help them and try to be a blessing to them and had a, they had a, a house full of kids and went over and, and just wanted to be a blessing to them. We said, look, we'll keep the kids. Y'all go out. We got over to the house and the house was just deplorable. I mean, it was, it was terrible. So we spent that evening while the husband and wife were out. We spent that evening cleaning. We sent the kids to our extended family's home and we cleaned and I fixed. And we were there till real late. We had told they were going to go stay the night somewhere. And we cleaned. And I mean, just you wouldn't believe what it was like. And I repaired things. And they got home and the next, the next day and the kids still weren't there. And they called us just weeping and crying and so thankful for what we had done. We said, look, if you just need help, just tell us. Okay. We'll take our kid, their kids back to them. A couple of weeks later, they called and they needed us to watch the, one of their, their dogs that they had and went back over and the house looked worse than it did the first time. Answer me this question. Was the work in vain? Yeah, it was. Okay, Christian, let's apply this to your heart and life. You've had pastors, you've had Sunday school teachers, you've had men and women invest in your heart and life with the gospel, with the word of God. Are you choosing the weak and beggarly things of this world and submitting yourselves to that? Or are you living the truth found in God's word on a daily, consistent basis? Can I tell you, that's, the, that's what Paul was faced with here. He says, look, if you're going to choose the weak and beggarly, then my labor was in vain. Worthless. A waste of time, energy, and effort. And Christian, tonight, let's not make all that's been invested in us Worthless. The Bible says to give honor to whom honor is due, correct? You know one way we can give honor? Simply by when somebody has invested in your life and heart with the word of God, try to live it. Jesus Christ came and he gave up all for you and for me. Everything. 
He gave up heaven to live as a man. He gave up life for yours and for mine. Now I know His glory is coming. But are you making what He did vain, empty, worthless? Oh yeah, I've got my, I've accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. That's your fire insurance. But are you living for Him? Paul simply says, look, if you're going to choose that, is my labor in vain? Now you're going to find out going forward. No, it's not. But God's always working. But I want to, I want to ask you tonight, Christian, is my labor in vain? And I'm speaking for God, not me. If God, God's standing right here, I'll be his mouthpiece tonight. And him saying, is my labor in vain? Now, Christian, apply that to every Sunday school teacher and pastor you've had. Was there labor in vain? May we determine choose tonight no I'm not we're not going to live perfectly but may we choose not to submit ourselves to the weak and beggarly things of this world the sin of this world may we choose the Holy Spirit's power in our heart and life to choose to live for God now more than ever can I tell you that's what our world needs that's what your neighborhood needs that's what your workplace needs. It needs someone who's willing to say, Lord, I can choose to submit to that or I can choose to live by your grace through your Holy Spirit that dwells within me and have his, your power in my life. You have that choice, Christian. If you're here tonight and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, guess what? You're stuck under this weak and beggarly area. And tonight, if you don't know, I'd love to share from God's Word how you can have the Holy Spirit dwell within you to have this power to be able to choose not to serve sin. But Christian, tonight, we have a, a, there's a valid question put to you tonight. Paul, if Paul were standing here tonight, and if you will, we're the church of Galatia, and he turns to us and he says, he, he says, wait, how be it then, you know, he goes through this passage, and he gets to that last verse and he says, you observe days and months and ye times and years. You know, so many times we're talking about, you know, the Lord's coming back soon. He's coming back soon. And we're all talking about times and there's men and women out there trying to pick the time, pick the day. And when God says, no man knoweth the time. And they're trying to pick it all and they're studying it. And he says, but I am afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul were standing here today, he'd be asking that question if you were the church of Galatia. Was my labor in vain? He's going to beg him for something. Next week you're going to see, he's going to say, I beseech you, be as I am. He's going to beg him. But before we, have to, before we can get to that, you needed to be faced with that question. Is my labor in vain? Listen, I'm going to close with this illustration, and I think it's fitting. Being a youth pastor for over 15 years, it never failed. We'd go to teen camp, and you know when you go to teen camp, you lose everything, right? No phones. No, I mean, before that we didn't have phones, but no, no games. Now it's no games, no phones, no, no iPods, no radios, no nothing. You lose it for a week. And you get Bible, and you get friends, and you get Bible, and you get friends. And it, all week, and God gets a hold of you. Then you come home. You pick up that game device, you pick up your phone. It's almost like a magnet, it goes... And it sticks to your hand. And they always said, they always told me in college and other youth pastors always told me, the hardest thing is for teens to keep a decision after they've gone home from camp. Why? Because the world enters back into their life. And they choose the things of this world. 
Can I tell you some adults, we're just big teenagers. Let's be honest, real with ourselves. I told you the worst thing you can do is lie to yourself. Because you'll lie to yourself long enough to believe it. Adults, we do the same thing, Christians. We'll come to church and we'll hear a great message. And man, one that we know we need to do something about. And we walk out those doors and we get in our car and it goes out the window. Is my labor in vain? Tonight, let's choose. God, I don't want your life that you gave to me to be in vain. I don't want your word that you, that you, so many men and women sacrifice themselves to preserve so that I could have it today. I don't want to sac, I don't want to, I don't want this to be nothing. I don't want my relationship with you to be nothing. Tonight, my labor is going to be to choose. My decision is going to be to choose and to constantly, every day, choose to walk with you through the power and strength of your Holy Spirit. Tonight, would you choose that with me? With every head bowed and every eye closed, let's stand to our feet tonight. Standing to our feet tonight, would you make that decision? Would you make that choice? Would you say, that's me tonight? Would you say in your heart and life, God, there are some things in my life that I have gone back to. And I don't want, I don't want what you've given to me to be vain. I don't want it to be empty. I don't want it to be nothing. As you've given me so much. God, search my heart tonight and see, rec- see what I mean. I give myself back to you again and not back to the world. Tonight, would you make that choice? I, I wonder how many of you would, would come to this altar and I say, Lord, I choose. I choose you, not the weak and beggarly things of this world. I choose you. I choose to live for you. I choose to decide not to submit myself back to sin, but to, through the Holy Spirit's power, choose not to sin. I'm going to choose that tonight. Maybe tonight you don't know the Lord is your Savior. I'd invite you down to this altar and let us take God's holy word, show you how you can know for sure your sins are forgiven, that you'll spend eternity in a place called heaven. We have what we call an invitation. Brother Brian's going to sing, the music's going to play, and we invite you down to this altar. Christian, would you come? Make a choice tonight. Make a decision tonight. Say, I decide what you've done for me, Lord, is not in vain. I'm coming.